All right, I'm pretty excited. This just came in the mail. It's one of the original ping punch golf balls from the 1980s. You might know that these have become pretty collectible over the last couple of years. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the history of ping golf balls, especially the ping punch. Let's get started. <laughs> I'll start off by saying that I've been aware of these golf balls for quite a while now, probably around 10 years, but there's precious little information online about any of the manufacturing that Ping has done in the golf ball industry. So almost all of the information in this video comes from a very nice customer service representative named Adam at Ping headquarters. So thanks Adam for the information. Over a 20 year period, Ping manufactured millions of golf balls, but not all of them were two colors. In fact, the earliest golf balls in 1977, called the Karsten 1, were all white. I think they looked like this, although pictures on the internet are few and far between. The Karsten 1 was a balata covered ball, which was pretty normal for the time, and it had a liquid core. Ping also made the Karsten 2 and the Karsten 3 at that time. The Karsten 2 and 3 had a surlin cover, but the 2 had a solid core with the 3 having a wound core. So what's the difference between all these different materials that golf balls are made from? Well, let's look at the cover. The cover of a golf ball greatly impacts the feel and amount of spin it can produce. Today, premium golf balls have a urethane elastomer cover, a plastic polymer material that returns to its original shape after being deformed. But from the start of the 20th century up to the 1990s, balata, a sap-like substance derived from trees in Central and South America, was used to make the covers of golf balls. Blotta made for golf balls that felt soft when struck and gave plenty of spin, but they are not very durable. Golfers of a certain vintage will recall cutting these balls up on a regular basis. Blotta was also expensive to source, which made these balls retail at a premium price. A synthetic rubber product, Serlin, offered a less expensive, more durable, but less spinny option for golf ball manufacturers. It makes sense, I think, that Ping made two of its three original first golf balls with these covers because I've always thought of Ping as a company which not only tailored to professional golfers, but also to the average weekend warrior who is maybe more concerned about the durability and price of their golf ball than how spinny it was. I've got one of the original Karsten golf balls here and the cover feels pretty hard, so I'm thinking this is one of the Surlin models. But the original Karsten balls were only sold in white. We didn't see the iconic two-color balls come out until late 1982 or early 1983. The first two-color ball was the Ping Eye, which was first produced in white, or yellow, or orange, as well as a yellow-orange combination which became known as the Ping Punch. I've got that Ping Punch here, and this is sort of the iconic ball that I always think of when I think of the two-tone golf balls. The orange and yellows were pretty popular, a lot were produced, and you also saw them re-released in 2021 as the foam practice balls by Ping. You also see this on a lot of the apparel and ad campaigns for Ping now. White orange and white yellow were also available in 1983, and in 1984, the white-pink combination was introduced. In 1992, the I2 ball replaced the Ping I. They were produced in the same colors and combinations as well, but they also added red-white, white-lavender, and white-blue. So far we've seen seven different color combinations, but around this time Ping started to open it up for custom colors. Companies could order balls that match their logos or their company colors. And so at this point, Ping kind of lost track of exactly how many color combinations they've made, but it's somewhere between probably 75 and 100 that were produced on scale, as well as lots and lots of others made in small batches. Also part of the customization process was custom logos, and Ping offered up to five different custom colors that could be printed on the balls as well. If you take a look online, you'll see lots of different examples of uh, balls from the era, and the Ping team did amazing work in some of these different offerings. Ping founder Karsten Solheim had a real eye for quality, and any balls that weren't quite up to spec were marked as promotional and often given away to junior programs at local courses. I think this level of customization is part of what makes these so collectible today, especially the late I2 runs in the late 1990s. 
there were so many different combinations out there, and a lot of them in small batches, that they were pretty rare to go and find. You can look on websites like pingballs.com to see the prices for different color combinations, and even the more common combos like the punch still hold up in value pretty well today. So why make a two-color ball in the first place? Well, my source at Ping outlined two reasons. First of all, they were hoping it would be easier to see in the air. Although I'm not going to hit my golf ball anytime soon, Rick Shields made a video a couple years ago where he hit some different colors of golf balls on par 3s and par 4s and par 5s, and he did note that you could see the curvature of the ball pretty well as it moved through the air, but that it was also difficult to track at farther distances and he didn't often know how far he hit it. The second reason was in putting. Because you've got this equator, you've got something nice to line up with the line of the putt, and a lot of modern golf balls have this as well with different alignment aids. It was very, very easy to see if you were hitting the putt dead center or not because you'd see the wobble in the golf ball because of the two colors. But unfortunately, the two colored balls didn't sell very well and they weren't picked up by any pros on the professional tour. They were mainly used in the putting green and by amateurs. So Ping tried a few more times. They released the Ping 393 in 1993, as well as the Ping Zing in the same year. Their last offering was the Ping CT374, and I've got one of those here. It's a two-piece ball, again, with the Serlin cover. Sadly, after that, Ping stopped manufacturing golf balls altogether. But luckily, because of collectors, we're able to still enjoy these today. And it is sort of fun that they've got this piece of history that you can look back on and reminisce about playing these golf balls back in the 80s and 90s. I'd like to think that if Ping started manufacturing golf balls again today, I'd go out and buy a couple of dozen and play them. But I guess until then, I'll have to just be content with Srixons. Thanks for watching.